right, there's a whole lot that we can never get right. So in September 2015, this is exactly seven years ago, the United Nations General Assembly um, made a declaration, declaration on trans transforming our world, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Very ambitious, uh, but I guess given the state of our world, it was and remains necessary to, to be ambitious and, and to push the boundaries. So that came with the adoption of the 17 um, SDGs, but today we are going to focus on one target of one of those goals. And we're going to address goal three, which uh, stipulates that we, should, we, we will ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all peoples of all ages. So target eight of that uh, goal um, says that we'll achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health care services, and access to safe, effective, quality, um, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. Again, quite ambitious. So since 2015, um, you know, good strides have been made. Some, some progress has been made. Unfortunately, with regard to, to this particular target, and especially for our region, um, I think we're still a far cry from, from it's full or even modest realization. Um, we still have millions of children, especially those under the age of five, dying uh, because they can't access um, care. We have, if we think about, and, and you know, every four of these five deaths are happening either in sub Saharan Africa or in Southern Asia. If we think about maternal um, health, we still have a disproportionate number of deaths happening. Uh, in this same region, the same story for HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, cancer, and so on and so forth. So we begin to almost despair. We say, is, is, this, is this a mirage <laughs> that just as we think we're getting close, it moves away? Um, so this, uh, this is the, the question that we'd like to, to get to today um, and to say, is this equitable? Um, and viable healthcare, affordable, you know, all these things that, that we find in this um, target, are they going to be a reality for 2030? That is a big question. So we have, um, we have four panelists um, lined up. We have Dr. Mamadou Sele Lee, we have Dr. Blake Angel, we have uh, Dr. Emanuela Faith, Amoako, and we have Dr. Kenneth Yakubo. Um, each of those is going to be addressing a specific aspect. So I'd like to begin with Dr. Mamadou Sele Lee. Uh, he's the Director of Legal Affairs and Partnerships at the National Agency for Universal Health Coverage in Senegal. So clearly he's the man to speak to about universal health coverage if we're thinking Senegal. Among his many publications, Mamadou is the lead author of the recent paper, Universal Health Insurance in Africa, a narrative review of the literature on institutional models. Um, it was published earlier this year in the BMJ Global Health. And um, I, it's, it's a paper that I highly recommend if you want to, to quickly get an understanding of what's happening with universal health coverage on the African continent. So Mamadou is going to be talking about 15 years of reforms in Africa for universal health coverage and financial protection. Who did what? Mamadou, you want to take it away? Thank you, Olive. Uh, hello, everyone. I have uh, some issue with my network, but I think that it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, now I will, uh, I will share my, uh, my screen. Okay. Okay, is it okay? Okay. Okay, so like I tell you, I'm uh, I'm delighted to be uh to be participating in this uh, in this webinar, and I thank the George Institute for for inviting me. 
Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to change the, the theme of my opening remarks uh, slightly. Uh, instead of uh, answering the question, who did what in, in Africa on USC, I propose to answer the, the question, where are we now? The idea is to give a global picture of USC in, uh, in Africa. To do so, uh, I will use two, two approaches. In the first, I will focus on, uh, on countries that have officially decided to carry out USC reforms. Then in the, in the second approach, I will look at all the health systems in the continent, let's say in the WHO African region, and indicate their performance in terms of uh, UHC indicators. The first approach has a small difficulty. African countries do not have the same definition of UHC. For some, UHC is universal health insurance. We, the French speaking countries of Africa, are largely responsible for this uh, misunderstanding. I will come back to this issue later if time permits, but for now, Let's just, let's, let's just note that uh, in some African countries, UHC equals universal health insurance. That being said, addressing UHC uh, through uh, universal insurance is not so bad because it is on the issue of financial barriers to care that there is less progress in Africa. Uh, health uh, authority in Africa have always acted on uh, different dimensions, except on financial protection issues. Fortunately, this is changing. More and more countries are, uh, are implementing uh, health insurance, uh, universal insurance program. Even so, there are more countries where there is no universal uh, insurance program. We, uh, we did a, a, liter, a literature review that went up to 20, 2020. We found that 60% of uh, African countries do not have a uh, universal financial risk protection scheme. Now let's take the, the other approach uh, that, uh, that is to measure the progress of all health systems in Africa with or without universal access program. This progress is measured on the UHC targets the essential uh, serv uh, service coverage index and the financial protection index. As a reminder, the service coverage index is the synthesis of, uh, of, 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 four, synthesis of, four se of, of several indicators related to four categories of health services, maternal and child health, infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, and uh, service capacity and accessibility. The WHO uh, divides the WHO. Uh, so I say the WHO divides the, the 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 coverage index into five levels. So uh, the the scale the scale ranges from very low to to very high. And in Africa, for the seventy uh, the for, the forty seven countries uh, in the WHO Afrozone the scores range from 28 to 75, 28 for Chad and 75 for, for Algeria. No African country is ranked in the, in the first group. Most African countries are in the, in the group three. The, the, the highest uh, average uh, indices were recorded in uh, Southern Africa and North Africa. In West Africa and East Africa, we have the largest increase over the, far, over the past 15 years. And if you look at the four subcomponents of the services coverage uh, index, we see that the fastest improvement has been in the fight against uh, infectious diseases and maternal and child health. And but progress has been slower on non-communicable disease. Uh, let's conclude on the, on the second pillar of the UHC, which is financial protection. In, in recent years, uh, out-of-pocket payments have increased in most African countries, even in countries with universal insurance. This may be a sign that insurance mechanisms have not achieved the, de the, the desired efficiency. Uh, however, it, 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 in more than half of the countries in the WHO African region, the catastrophic spending has declined, uh, but not, not really. 
And for me, the, the, the results of the, on this pillar of the USC are, are modest. To conclude, to conclude, to, center, uh, to summarize, we, we can, we can uh, voila, we, to conclude this introductory, introductory remarks, the following can be summarized. First, coverage of essential services is improving fairly quickly, especially in the fight against uh, communicable disease and in maternal and child, child, child health. However, progress is slower in the fight against chronic disease. Uh, second, there are more, there are not many African countries with universal financial risk to protection scheme. And third, financial protection is quite low on the continent overall. However, there is a reduction in the incidence of catastrophic spending in a majority of countries. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mamadou. So an interesting mixed bag uh, of where we are. And I think that's uh, maybe you've answered what questions, who did what, so where are these uh, ways universal health coverage um, gaining ground and, and in you know, what state is it? Um, this I think is a good uh, point to move on to Dr. Blake Angel. So Dr. Blake Angel is a senior research fellow in the health system science program at the George Institute for Global Health. He's a conjoint senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine and Health at uh, the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. He's also an H, um, NH MRC Emerging Leadership Fellow. He's a health economist um, conducting research on the equity, efficiency, and incentive impacts of health policy in health systems around the world. Um, Blake is going to uh, focus his comments on stronger investments for stronger health systems, addressing key challenges on the path to universal coverage. Uh, Blake, you have the floor. Fantastic. Thank you, Olu. And thank you, Mamadou, for that, that start. That was an excellent presentation. Um, just let me share my slides. Great. Um, I think I can confidently say I've probably got the least experience uh, when it comes to African health systems, uh, but I am very excited to share some of the research that we've been doing here and hopefully spark a bit of discussion with the other panelists and everyone online. Um, so let's talk about health coverage. Um, this is some comparative analysis that we conducted through the Lancet Nigeria Commission, um, where we're looking to build a roadmap for Nigeria to achieve um, universal health coverage. And so we wanted to, as a starting point, look at how, how Nigeria um, had performed in terms of health system coverage and health outcomes over time and compared it to the other um, countries of West Africa. Um, so this is a graph showing the estimated uh, population with access, ex estimated proportion of the population, sorry, um, with access to the health system um, across the 16 countries of West Africa. Um, there are a few key points that I thought it might be good to bring up now. Um, as you can see in the general um, direction of the graph, um, health system coverage is largely going up as, as we just heard. Um, there are a few key exceptions and, and you can see the green line of Nigeria in the middle, which has sort of plateaued, plateaued a bit and, and gone down. Um, we found that health expect, as you, as you might expect, when uh, coverage is going up, health expenditure is going up across, across the region, albeit from a very uh, low base. And health is largely uh, improving across across the region, as Olive highlighted in her opening mark, uh, remarks. Um, just as a quick example, this is the change in mortality by age um, that Nigeria experienced between 1998 and 2019. So you can see there are quite dramatic uh, drops in the mortality rates uh, for all ages um, across the population. Uh, but as we just heard, the, these nations do remain somewhat off universal coverage. 
Um, so while health spending across the region was low by global standards, um, increased expenditure didn't always translate to better outcomes or coverage, um, which I think highlights the potential for both uh, cross-country learning and um, the argument for, or the potential to, to be able to do uh, more with the existing investment. Um, Nigeria, for example, uh, had the third highest health expenditure per capita, um, but trailed uh, the other countries of the region in, in many outcomes. Um, some of that comes down to the type of expenditure. Um, Nigeria had the highest out-of-pocket expenditure in the region um, at 77% of total health expenditure. And you can see here that Nigeria spends less than the African and world averages on health, and that there is a particularly low level of government spending. Um, so th this is one major, uh, though certainly not novel, uh, point to raise when it comes to universal coverage. Um, financing needs to be rebalanced away from private expenditure. Um, and, and we did make a number of recommendations on how to try and do that, um, as well as how to raise additional funds in, in the report. Uh, which is there. Um, so as most of you will no doubt know, the equity implications of lower coverage are quite stark. Um, in Nigeria, at least, though, I also suspected similar in other countries, um, the biggest burden falls on the very young and, and the poor. Um, to phrase it a bit more positively, uh, it means that the, the young and the poor have the most to gain from, from reform and universal coverage. Um, this is some modelling I led with the commissions showing the number of potentially avertable child and maternal deaths per year. Uh, if a package of cost-effective interventions is implemented across Nigeria under different policy sets. As you can see, the numbers uh, in terms of uh, numbers of deaths that could be averted are, are very big. Um, the estimated costs, uh, while large compared to current total health spending, um, weren't, weren't actually very big when compared to other things, in, including the per capita income of the country. Uh, nonetheless, the cost of universal health coverage is going to be big, as we all know. Um, achieving the goal, though, will require a lot more than money. Um, as we've already heard, there are numerous complex issues um, that come with trying to improve coverage of a health system. Um, one particular issue that I've been focused on with my research is the supply of health workers. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, has approximately 3% of the world's health workers, um, but 25% of the burden of disease. Uh, health workers need to be trained, employed, dispersed across the country, motivated and ultimately retained in the health system, which requires much more than just money. Um, so we've been working on a number of these issues here at the George, particularly around the retention and motivation of community health workers, health worker corruption and training. Um, I think I'm out of time for my introductory remarks, uh, so I can't go into much detail here, um, but I thought I could pull out a, a couple of um, common threads, uh, or probably more accurately, big generalizations that, that are coming up in the research, in my research today, that I thought might be relevant to the broader discussion in case uh, anyone wants to pick them up later. Um, first obvious one is health workers are key to health systems and population health. Um, second, many countries are spending millions of whatever currency they're engaged with uh, on, pol on policies that have, that have potentially little or no payoff and often don't or can't evaluate the value of the spend or the impact of the policies. Um, if not pro properly supported, workers may be forced to leave their jobs, miss work, break terms of their employment contracts or levy informal payments on patients to get by. Um, at the same time, some health workers will break the rules regardless of whether they are supported or not. Um, policy interventions create incentives which health workers, policymakers, and the public all respond to. Um, these need to be carefully targeted and monitored to make sure they're promoting population health and not working against it. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there and let, um, let the others speak. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Blake. Uh, between you and Mamadou, you've given us a whole lot of stuff to chew on. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be getting uh, questions and comments based on, on your presentation. So clearly, 
um, a lot that needs to be done. And while you show there's some progress and some improvement, I think um, the challenges are stuck, the ch challenges uh, of underinvestment and, and the, res the results you know, can be seen from the burden. Um, I'd like to, uh, so first, just to remind um, our audience to please go to the chat and post your questions, your comments, uh, as indeed, this is, um, we, we are trying to get as much interaction here as we can so that we engage with, with the different uh, practitioners, professionals that we have um, online, uh, as opposed to this just being uh, between the panelists. So let's quickly move to our third panelist. Uh, we've had some very broad strokes and some fairly specific and very engaging information. Uh, but I'd like us to move to somebody that's actually where the rubber hits the road, where uh, practice is happening. And this is Dr. Emanuela Faith Amoako um, Ela. She's the head of clinical affairs at Yimachi Biotechnology in Ghana. She's a pediatric oncology fellow at Kolebu Teaching Hospital. And uh, she has a keen interest in oncogenetics and has extensive experience working in resource-limited settings. Ella established an oncology shared care unit at the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital, which helps to improve patients' access to care. She's a strong advocate, uh, no doubt, of children and believes that cancer care and research in children must be diverse. So Ella is going to be talking about a very interesting here, making the unseen visible. And there's plenty that's unseen, but there's also plenty that's visible. So making the unseen visible, how a shared care model is transforming child cancer care in Ghana. Ella, take it away. Thank you very much, Olive. I will share my screen. Please. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'll be taking us on this, how a shared care model is transforming childhood cancer care in Ghana. I'll start with a brief introduction about childhood cancers. There are about 400,000 cases diagnosed every year globally. And most of these cases are in low and middle income countries. However, um, high income countries record 80% survival of wells. Uh, low-income countries record as low as 20% survival in these children. Um, I'll delve into Ghana. Um, it's a country in West Africa with a population of, of about uh, 30 million people, and 38% of which are under the age of 14, means that we have more children in our population than uh, most countries would. Um, in Ghana, there are only two comprehensive cancer treatment centers that have everything like from radio, radiotherapy, radiology, like access to everything. And all both of these centers are located in the southern part of the country. Now using um, a, a population extrapolation studies, depending on, uh, based on our population, we expect to see about 1,200 cases of childhood cancers every year. However, uh, in 2019, uh, just about 300 of them uh, would present for any kind of treatment uh, at both of these centers. And um, this is partly because of access to care, or this was partly due to um, limited access to care. And uh, studies have shown that the shared care model has improved access to care in certain countries, in uh, low and middle income countries. So uh, a shared care model is just a network of pediatric care um, wards that's made up of a hub uh, and then shared care center, where the hub is the tertiary facility or the comprehensive cancer treatment center that is equipped with advanced facilities. And sorry. Uh, and the shared care center, uh, has this relationship with, with uh, the hub where referrals can happen, there's communication and children can be sent um, when help is needed. Like during emergencies, when people can't go to the hub, they can pre pre present to the shared care center. 
And so based on how this works, um, we in the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital uh, decided to establish one uh, in November 2019. It was right on time because in 2020, COVID hit, most people couldn't as, um, have access to these uh, hub facilities, the comprehensive uh, cancer treatment centers. Uh, most of uh, so Accra and Kumasi were on lockdown, people couldn't travel. And Cape Coast Teaching Hospital is in the central region of Ghana, but it serves the central, western, and parts of the Ashanti regions. Uh, with a catchment, it treats about 7 million people in this, in, in this region. And at the time, um, we just had a pediatric ward um, as, and then pediatricians, the, I mean, uh, the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital used to treat um, adult cancers. And so we just um, worked with what we had. We didn't have any nurses trained. We had pediatricians and not pediatric oncologists. Uh, but people were willing to take the chance to try and treat people with cancer. And in a year, we're able to treat 48, we're able to see 48 children uh, who were diagnosed with cancers, most of them being lymphomas and leukemias. Um, those, uh, the age range was uh, from um, two years to nine years. And um, of all the children that were diagnosed with cancer, unfortunately, 19 of them had advanced disease 19 of them were able to get upfront treatment, uh, were able to refer nine um, immediately to the hub that needed um, treatment. 10 of the 19 patients successfully completed treatment. And when we look at these figures, comparing the previous years that were seen at the hub, the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, you can see a 23% increment in the number of cases. And uh, because over a thousand cases of childhood cancers go undetected each year, uh, shared care centers would improve this. And as you can see from here, a single shared care center significantly increased the number of patients diagnosed. And we know that every new diagnosis is an opportunity to save a child's life. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, but thank you very much, Ella. I was still engaged in the story and then you suddenly stopped. <laughs> so, uh, no, but uh, a very interesting example. Uh, and we would have wanted to hear a bit more about how um, this, this, the relationship between the hub and, and this center and, and how the financial protection happens, how, um, you know, the financial barriers are removed so that children can access these services both at the, at the center and at the hub. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like us to quickly move to the fourth panelist um, who's going to um, address, again, a very interesting aspect that uh, Blake uh, touched on and uh, that uh, the, the panelist is going to to work a little bit more detail into Dr. Kenneth Yakobo uh, is a family physician from Nigeria and a PhD candidate in the Health System Science Unit at the George Institute for Global Health. Yakobo's research focuses on the rights-based right -based, right -based perspectives for interpreting and addressing global health worker shortages. Global health worker shortages. Um, yeah, red flag right, right there. He is also a colleague in the institutes. Um, Africa Initiative to expand research engagement in the continent. And uh, this, uh, this uh, string of webinars has been uh, a part of that uh, initiative to engage more with, with um, scientists on the continent. Uh, hopefully that this can generate more um, collaboration and connections. So Yakubo is going to talk about moving forward. So he has the daunting task, having had what the challenges are, what the, you know, the, the sheer magnitude of the problem. Moving forward on universal coverage, he's going to give us ideas for sustainable progress. So Yakubu, the floor is yours. Thanks, Olive. Um, you're making my work so easy. 
So um, I'm just going to share my screens. I will want to again thank you all for um, the opportunity to um, share my thoughts with you. Um, just to confirm that you can see my screen okay. Um, and yes, I'll take that as a yes. yes. Okay, all right. Um, so thanks a lot for the the introduction, Olive, and, and great presentation, Ella. I really enjoyed listening to your positive stories and, and also enjoyed the, the presentation of the other panelists. I, I, I just thought I would share a little bit from the work that I am doing from uh, my PhD, um, as I think it bears a lot of relevance for what we are discussing today on um, um, universal health coverage. And, and, I'm, and I'm going to be doing a bit of an abstraction um, to sort of highlight some of the ideas that I am learning from this little piece of work um, done in Nigeria, but I think has implications um, for similar settings on, on the continent. Like Olive mentioned, I see health workforce shortages as um, a violation of people's right to health. And of course that has implications for um, universal health coverage. And, and, and again, I'm situating this work within a Nigerian context. Um, so when we talk about access to health services, um, we can't do that without health workers. And, and the recommended density for skilled health workers, at least just to have essential health services has been placed at about four per thousand. In, in the Nigerian context, um, we've been able to do up to 1.8 as of 2018. Uh, and you will agree with me that this has a lot of implications. Um, and uh, alongside other issues that have already been mentioned, um, one particular issue is migration of, of health workers from the country. Um, the, the figures that you can see here are specific for the United States um, showing um, the influx of um, health workers from Nigeria to the United States. And at least this gives you a bit of a picture and perhaps an extrapolation of the impacts this has. So when, when this particular body of work was a mixed methods um, study, um, acknowledging the consensus about um, addressing governance of health worker migration rather than seeking to stop people from moving altogether. Migration is an age old human behavior. You can't stop it, but you can harness its benefits. And, and, and hopefully um, the, the assumption is that they can be mutual benefits. Of course, that does not always happen. Um, and so what we try to do in this study is to explore the perceptions of health workers that live in Nigeria regarding a system of rules that, that influences the way people People interact and behave towards migration. And um, I, like I mentioned, we, we did ad adopt a mixed methods approach and, and define these rules as, as formal regulations, sometimes written laws, or this sort of informal shared understanding of how things work. So always look for the rules. Uh, and this was what we found as a system of rules influencing how people behave, starting from um, state actors to my very right. Um, there is a formal recognition of what should be done concerning funding and um, concerning um, ensuring political and social stability and, and, and maintaining um, a health workforce. But there is a counteracting rule. Um, some of my participants label this as they don't care about us. Um, I have chosen to label that as um, a lack of respect for the right to health. On the far left is another system of rules within the society and within the health system. Um, and in the absence of being able to regulate or govern properly um, the way migration occurs, people have now begun to make a business um, out of supporting uh, people who want to migrate. And um, alongside that is this perception within the society that when you talk about perhaps improving um, health worker conditions, workforce conditions, you're talking about the labor rules and it's not a societal issue. Um, and, and to some extent, um, this sort of 
lack of sympathy um, for health workers. Health workers are considered to perhaps be arrogant and, and in their own space and disconnected from the community. And so there's this perception that this is not entirely a community problem. It's more of a workforce um, labor issue. And of course, um, I perhaps do not need to tell you about the inter professional rivalry and um, the, the, the lack of um, work oversight in the health facilities. And all of this have implications of, you know, on universal health coverage, but, but that's not my landing spot for today. I, I do think this bleakness offers us um, uh, an exciting opportunity you know, to, to change the rules. We created the rules, we, we can change them. Uh, and I mean, this is some of the things that I learned from, from that study, some of the implications, um, not necessarily just a top-down approach um, starting from um, the government, but it could also be from the bottom. Both of them can co occur. And, and in the response, and perhaps I'll have more opportunity to talk more about how this is already happening in the Nigerian context. Um, but but there, there is an opportunity for, for there to be more recognition of universal health coverage and all the things that feed into this. And there, there is an opportunity for this to be a collective ownership you know, of the problem within the society and not just by the government. But essentially there is an opportunity to ground this within norms, um, recognizing the inherent value in a human life and, and, and the societal norms that drive um, collective action and allowing this drive all of the things that, that we do. Um, there is an exciting opportunity to change the trend um, by, by, by changing our shared understanding of this problem. And, and I'll argue that that's, that is where sustainable progress towards universal health coverage can be made. Um, thank you. I will return back to you, Olive. Thank you very much, uh, Yakubu. So again, um, a lot of information to chew over. And um, yeah, again, a mixed bag, you know. So how do we how do we address this that um, that without which you know we, we cannot make um, much headway with industrial coverage? How do we deal with the with the workforce? How do we deal with the the threat, not just the threat, I mean, the continuing brain drain. And as Yakubo says, um, migration is, you know, it's just part of, of human nature. People are going to move uh, regardless. Uh, interesting there about the rules, uh, Yakubo. So we've, we've had our four panelists. We have uh, an interesting stream of questions coming in. And I'd like us to, um, to begin to work on those, um, there are questions regarding, uh, in fact, that one of the very early ones was by Kat, regarding how we deal with the brain drain. What do we do? How can we stop this from happening? And I think, Yakubu, you, um, you know, touched a bit on, on what that would mean. I think, Angel, as well. Uh, Frederick asked about um, health medical supplies um, and the fact that uh, Africa, for instance, produces only 2% of its of what it requires. And so how can we aspire for universal health coverage if um, that is the gap that we're trying to overcome? So um, I encourage the panelists to answer some of those questions in the chat, but um, I'd also like uh, to direct some of those questions so that they can be, you can maybe answer them live. Uh, Yakubo, while you have the floor, did you want to make any to comment on, indeed, as we said at the beginning, what, how do we deal with this? Any insights into this for countries that are uh, coming up with their plans for universal health coverage, they're looking at, um, at you know, financial reforms and their health workforce is living in drugs. Any comments? Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks, Olive. I, I mean, that there's, there's no silver bullet, I will say, um, but, but there are certain patterns that uh, I have seen from the little that I've begun to do um, 
and, and, and part of the reasons why human rights norms or human rights frameworks really appeal to me is um, that you are not just sitting down and asking the government to solve the problem, um, you're promoting particip a participatory approach in both understanding the problem and approaching it. And, and, and there is evidence that whenever there's been this participatory approach and ownership of one understanding the problem and responding to it, um, the chances of success is, is higher. Um, the, the, the beginning block really is um, really forging that sense of accountability where state actors are willing to say, hey, see, you can reach us. We want to engage. We do have a problem. and We do need to have a collective ownership of, of this problem. And, and each setting and each region is able to define how they start um, um, addressing this problem. The quick thing that I'll add there is that where um, skilled health workers or any type of health worker have experienced from some form of societal support and, and, and communal engagement, um, the excitement at work has been different. Um, even when the pay has been an issue, uh, and I'll just leave it at there, I'm, I'm happy to come, come back to this again. Uh, thank you very much, um, Yakubu. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Blake to make a quick comment about that, and then I wanted to bring in Mamadou. Um, somebody's asking a question, Professor Chamanwa is wondering, what are we missing? This is not a new conversation. He takes it all the way back to the Alma Ata of 1980 something. And he says, is there something we are missing? So Blake, uh, quickly, if you could comment on, on this issue of um, you did say, you did talk about more investment, the need for more investment, but is, you know, how, what are governments to do to ensure that that investment touches this hot button of the health workforce in order that um, we can maybe reduce the financial, uh, you know, promote financial protection for those that are wanting to come into the health services for access. Thank you. Yeah, sure. There's a lot. There's a lot going on there, so it's it's not easy to um, uh, to uh, to go through. Um, I think in terms of what Yakuba was just saying, in terms of the brain drain, um, I agree with everything he said, and also what he mentioned in his presentation about we we made the rules, we can change them. Um, I, I think it's crazy that um, people that low and middle income countries are, are paying to train workers and then the uh, us and the richer countries are benef benefiting from it and um, there is definitely there we need to think of a way to to stop that happening and get um, as you say other people will will migrate but um, some sort of compensation scheme or um, or, or similar, and um, this has come up a little bit in, in work we've been doing looking at um, return of service schemes in um, a couple of Southern African countries whereby um, the state funds the training of the worker uh, on the proviso that they, they come back and serve in their rural communities. And, and the findings are very preliminary at the moment, but anecdotally, um, there's a lot of stories of people, people then leaving um, and breaking the contract with no sort of uh, payback to the state, I guess. The state, so the state is sort of losing both the money, but more so losing the health worker, um, which is probably more, more devastating than the, the actual money. So I, I, I and part of that is actually the, the systems aren't robust enough to be able to track um, all the beneficiaries. So we, we were trying to find out who, um, who was receiving these these bursaries, as they're called? And there's no sort of there were, in most of the countries there was no there was no sort of database. So so I think simple things like that, whereby at least um, knowing who is being trained, who's received uh, these funds, um, I think that can form the basis of some way of sort of um, getting evening it up a bit. Um, and okay. and just on that, sorry. Just on that second point about out-of-pocket costs, um, 100%. I think the, the key learning from the world is um, 
there needs to be more government investment uh, in terms of and reduced out of pocket costs. Out of pocket costs are very inefficient ways of uh, way of financing healthcare. That it's it's unfair. It punishes the the poor and it, it stops people getting services that they need and and often increases the the overall cost of care. Just very quickly. Uh, thank you very much, Blake. And we, we could, I mean, we could spend the rest of our time just talking about this one thing, but I wanted us to move on. Yeah, Kat had mentioned, you know, an interesting idea. Do we force people to return home or to stay in their countries or to create a thriving environment where they feel welcome and willing to stay? Um, but I wanted to, to move on to Mamadou and, and ask uh, what has been asked maybe a more general question. And I know you had your um, in the summary of your, your short presentation, uh, some of the, the issues to address this. But if you are thinking about, you know, we are just a short seven and a half years to 2030. And so it's beginning to look kind of uh, unreal that we might get there. And this is the state of our universal health coverage and it's nowhere close to what we aspire to. So uh, Mama, do are there any any specific points that you would say, if we are to get there, this is what we're missing and this is where we need to put the focus. What, what do countries need to do to get it right? Thank you. Thank you, Olive, uh, for the question. Uh, so uh, I think that if we have to choose uh, one thing, I think that it's, uh, it's the money. The money is the, is the real problem, but if you, if you, uh, I, I want to bug you to get back to the to one question in the, in the in the uh, yeah in, in the chat uh, about uh, things which is done uh, since uh, eight years. Uh, that's right. Many things have indeed been tried to to several for for several decades. Uh, the discourse on uh, on access to care is uh, is old, uh, and one can have feeling that uh, the same things have been have been repeated decades for for decades uh, but we also must recognize that uh, these actions uh, have produced results probably not enough but what to do to move forward uh, i already I, I i think that the concept of usc can help to move forward it can achieve results that all the different previous uh, strategies have failed to achieve uh, the fact that the focus is now on the demand for care. And, and, and this is a great thing. Before the focus was only on the supply of care. But most importantly, there is today a lot of effort being uh, made to, to measure this progress. And that's very useful even for policymakers, being able to, to measure outcomes fairly accurately, uh, to have a toolbox as well uh, is very useful for, 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 for political leaders, and that is an innovation. Now to get to, 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 uh, to USC, uh, you need political will and a strong financial commitment. And Rwanda is a, is a good example. Uh, in 2020, a dozen taxes were earmarked to finance uh, access to care, and the results are immediate. So uh, for me, the, 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 main, the, the, the main key is the, is, the, is, the, is the public resources, the, final, the, the, the money, if you, if you promise. Uh, thank you very much. And may I remind um, our audience that when you're posting, if you could kindly choose to address your comment or your question to everyone so that it's not just coming to the panelists, but everybody can see your comment. Um, yeah, I wanted to take this to Ella. So Mamadou says it's the money. And I mean, in a way, we all acknowledge that it's the money, that it's the money that's going to buy these services. How is it being collected? How is it being pulled? How is it, how are those services being purchased once the money becomes available uh, for the service to then reach those that need it? I, I'm wondering in, in your experience um, in setting up this center, for instance, in, in Cape Coast and linking it to Kolebu, how are this, how is how is the access, the finance, how are the financial barriers being removed so that a child uh, coming from a poor family is able to access this care, that they're able to use expensive medicines and and, and equipment and everything 
without that being a barrier? How's that uh, happening? Maybe you can give us um, some insights into that. Well, thank you very much, Olive. And yeah, it's true. It's it's always the money. And um, uh, just before, I think it was just earlier this year that Ghana announced that childhood cancers, a few uh, childhood cancers would be covered by the national health insurance. But uh, prior to that, it was all out of pocket. Um, we were lucky um, to have NGOs come in to support um, these children who required maybe transportation to the to the hub and treatments. Um, there, there's a presence of certain NGOs, key NGOs that uh, support with treatment and then certain individuals that understand um, the, the, the issues that come with childhood cancers who would um, donate money to certain like specific children like I want to adopt this child for treatment but again it's it's not a very sustainable model and I think um, that's why our government has decided to um, uh, uh, bring on four main four of the most common childhood cancers in Ghana onto the um, health insurance scheme and we hope that it flows well. I mean, it's, ne it's never easy with government policies, but um, hopefully with time, we would get to see that. But yeah, for now, we still rely on um, donor donor funding. Thank you. Uh, well, that's, that, that's, I don't know how to take that. I mean, in a way, we are thankful that they've included these four commonest childhood cancers. But on the other hand, you're thinking, so a child that comes with a completely different cancer that is not included is going to be kept out of the door. I mean, it's going to be shut out. It's, um, yeah, and, and it's, yeah, so it's, it's an uncomfortable win if, if it's a win indeed. Um, and you do mention the point about donor funding and the fact that it's probably never assured. So uh, again, just highlighting what Mamadou said about, about political will, you know, why is it we are not putting our money where amounts are if we think this is an important problem? Why are we letting, why are we saying somebody else should fix the problem instead of putting, prioritizing it as, as part of our core um, national budget. Um, but I'd like to, to move on to um, a couple other uh, points that have been made. Um, so Blake, in your presentation, you did say that some governments are spending time uh, and effort on policies that cannot be evaluated, or maybe I'm not even very, did you want to throw some more light on that? Sure. I, I mean, one example is, is that health training that I mentioned, whereby um, there's almost certainly, there's obviously a benefit for training tra more health workers, but it, it's very unclear that it's the best or most effective use of money to train, the best way to use money to, to train the health workers. Um, wh what I was probably more thinking of when I said it, um, I've been involved in a bit of work on health worker corruption. Um, and so what has traditionally been the approach there is um, to overcome corruption, governments have invested in greater monitoring and punishment of health workers um, and spent quite a, quite a bit of money. Uh, and speaking very generally, um, there, there's very little evidence that that, that, that approach has that, that is, is bringing in the results. Yes, it, it, there's little impact. Essentially, what we've been finding is that the, peop the people with pa powerful connections can sort of get away, that, uh, get around these. Um, it's not, it's not always the case. <laughs> yes, whereas the ones who are trying to work uh, are actually sort of punished in a, in a weird way because they, they can't have um, right. they can't right. get away and, and there's all this wasted money. Um, so, that type of thing where a lot of money goes in, but there's no real um, oversight over the benefit right. of that. And it, it could be much better to just spend that money supporting the health workers and, you know, improving right. thank you. And then, so they want to turn, turn up to work, for example. Yes, thank you. And I think we can all think of such, you know, such situations. So I'd like to, we've run out of time and I'd like to bring this to a close. So I'm going to allow the panelists 
each panelist to make one quick closing, you know, give one quick closing thought. Um, and I'll do it in the reverse order. So I'd like to bring in uh, Yakubu. What, what is your last closing thought? Thanks, Olive. Um, I think for a sustainable progress towards attaining universal health coverage, um, there has to be a collective ownership of the efforts. Um, I, I get it that we will often want to start with the government, um, but it, it has to be rooted in, in, in civic engagement and social mobilization, and it has to be norms-driven. One of my favorite is, is human rights norms. Thanks, Olive. Human rights norms. Thank you very much, Yakubu. Uh, Ella, any closing thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, no child should be denied access to care based on which part of the equator they are born or which part of the hemisphere they are born. And it is an uh, ethical obligation to make sure that every child, like no child is left out, especially children in Africa. Thank you. No child should be left behind. Thank you very much, Ella. Blake, your closing thoughts? Uh, Yakuba actually stole mine, so I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, I, I think the political movement idea and, and ownership of the people over the health system is, is vital to get that extra level of investment and uh, coverage that we're after. Thank you very much. And Mamadou? Uh, thank you, Olive. I would con like to conclude by saying what I said earlier. We must increase public funds. Uh, work to reduce uh, out-of-pocket payments, especially for the poor. And on the supply side, work on uh, on primary health care. Thank you very much indeed. So Marinke just posted um, an email address in the chat. Uh, so if you have any thoughts, any questions that you'd like to appear in the blog that I did talk about at the beginning, kindly send them to that email address and we'll be sure to reach out to you and, and uh, ensure that we capture your thoughts in this closing blog. Um, an hour is a very short time to discuss this subject, but we are very grateful that you spent uh, the last 50, 58 minutes with us. And we, we would like to thank everyone that has participated. Certainly a big applause uh, for our panelists uh, who've done an amazing job. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, for having tea with Africa and talking about universal health coverage today. Thank you and have a wonderful day or evening uh, wherever you are.